hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to this special Arts of Play seminar on Edward Thomas. Um, we've got two papers tonight. The first one's going to be looking at Thomas's poetry and then we're going to move on to think about some of Edward Thomas's prose. Um, our first speaker is Dr Andrew Hodgson, who is a lecturer in Romanticism in the, the English department at the University of Birmingham. Andrew is the author of The Cambridge Guide to Reading Poetry. Um, and part of his, um, his monograph, Lyric Individualism, um, is also devoted to, to Thomas and to the idiosyncrasies of Thomas's lyric voice. So Andrew is going to treat us this evening to some um, close readings of, um, of Thomas's poetry and um, thinking about Thomas and place. So please welcome Andrew. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Um, I'm just going to share my screen uh, so I can put a PowerPoint up. Uh, so bear with me a second. Uh, is that now showing on people's screens? Good. Um, so uh, thanks. Jessica, for that introduction and for um, for giving me such a suggestive and a stimulating title as well, which um, I'll spend about 15 minutes, I think, uh, sort of contemplating um, and trying to say some things about uh, in, in relation to Thomas's poems. Um, so in, in what ways might we think of Thomas as a poet of place? Um, I think there are two main related ways in which that question's usually been answered. Um, first, that, that Thomas is a poet of sort of homely, perhaps even occasionally cosy locality, able to find a, a feeling of rootedness in quiet corners of, of farmyards, overrun orchards, and so on. Um, and secondly, that Thomas is a quintessentially English sort of poet, a poet whose Englishness is a matter of style and temperament um, as much as subject matter, the brooding, contemplative, muted intonations that are felt to uh, characterise his voice. And I suppose there's, there's also been some very good work uh, sort of parallel with that on, on Thomas's Welshness as well and the ways in which he might make or have regarded himself or tried to become a particularly Welsh kind of poet. Um, and all those readings, I think, have truth and, and value in them, um, particularly perhaps when one of the things that we um, that we might look to literature for at the moment is an idea of nationhood that, that doesn't involve um, dressing up in Union Jacks and so on. Um, but I think it makes sense to, to think that Thomas's poetry might be described um, as an art of place, not just because it's marked by a particular locality, um, but because it contemplates why places matter um, and engages in an effort, not always a successful effort, I think, um, to endow them with significance. That is to say that sometimes the poems are about the sense that you can't feel a connection with a place or the sense that a place is somehow um, resistant to being uh, accommodated or becoming accommodating. Um, Adelstrop, which I suppose most of you, if you know any of Thomas, will know, is perhaps the poem which first comes to mind when thinking of Thomas as a, a poet of, of sort of pastoral uh, locality. Um, but I think it's a poem far less certain about what place is and how we might experience place than that reputation uh, suggests. Um, Thomas said of place names in Hardy's poetry, 
that they save the poems from abstraction and lend a kind of magical reality. But Thomas handles the name Adelstrop in this poem. It begins as the name of both poem and a place in the title and then recurs uh, once in the first two stanzas. He handles this name as though he's jiggling a key in a lock, expecting it to open up a feeling of connectedness that it doesn't easily or immediately do. Um, so yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name, um, so we have this kind of pause, and it's only the name that he remembers, not the place, and then later what I saw in this seeming moment of revelation was Adelstrop, but then we get this moment of deflation again, only the name before the whole sort of opening out into the, the, the famous sort of astral music of the, of the final two stanzas. Um, so the poem is sort of constantly wavering between the sense that the name Adelstrop opens this portal to the thing itself, to this pure experience of place, and this worry that it's just a kind of bumping up against it as a, as a, as a, a substanceless word or, or, or a word that's not more than a word. Um, if only those poems into which our place names could be translated, Thomas wondered, in the South Country. And even when Adelstrop does manage to translate the name into an experience of the thing itself, it's only for a minute, and the boundaries of the location immediately blur. Um, I wanted to read you the ending of the poem. It's, it's, it's stopped by a, a kind of control bar on the bottom of my screen, but he, he sort of imagines these birds um, singing out in Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. And it's an affirmative, pleasurable ending to the poem, but also one that suggests how complicated and slippery the idea of place is. This sense that, that as soon as you start thinking of one place, you have to think of all these other places that are kind of concentrically in relation with it. And, and you can't quite ever stabilize yourself in, 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 in a kind of, or put boundaries around any locality. One of the moments uh, from Adelstrop that shadows the pastoral idyll of the poem is, is the blankness, or the sense of blankness described at the start of the second stanza. Uh, the steam hissed, someone cleared his throat, no one left, no one came on a bare platform. It's a remarkable moment, I think, for the way Thomas is prepared just to mark time, to make something out of nothingness. And its richness knows, owes to its ambiguity. It's possible to read this as a cherished moment of tranquility, but equally possible, I think, to find in it a rather daring apprehension of absence, a significance that will reveal itself, or a feeling that this is just an encounter with a bare place that has no substance to it, has been hollowed out uh, in some way. And what Thomas is presenting us with on that, that second reading, we might say, is an encounter with a place that won't quite or won't yet respond to our impulse to make it a home, to make it a place where we can feel at home. It's a potential meaninglessness that Thomas must confront before he wins through to the, the fuller sense of the place's significance at the end of the poem. Um, I wouldn't say that Thomas's poems are, are full of such occasions, um, but it, I do think it, they, they're sort of peppered with these moments where the impulse to take root in a landscape fails. Um, they're, they're peppered with these kind of uncanny instances of places or features of a landscape refusing to allow us to settle in them or with them. Um, in an opposite Way, the way in which he describes place names in Hardy, giving a kind of reality uh, to, to, the, to the landscape in which the poems are taking place. He writes, Thomas writes often in a way that sort of does abstract places so that concrete localities become kind of more symbolic landscapes or more, um, 
less polite, less precisely locatable kind of landscapes. Um, and, and often does this at moments where he's wanting to, or one of the things that the poems are doing, are expressing a sense of dislocation or expressing a sense of an inability to connect with the landscape. And this is a kind of maybe a slightly more desolate style of Thomas's writing sometimes. Um, so I thought I might skim through a, a small suite of examples of that. Um, firstly, um, a poem from 1915, um, The New House. Um, in December 1909, Thomas had moved with his wife, Helen, uh, to the house uh, on the slide there, which is uh, designed in an arts and crafts style by uh, Geoffrey Lupton. And it was at, at Wick Green, um, on the reach of a local town, the village of, of Steep. Um, but it was felt by both Thomas and, and Helen, Edward, both Edward and Helen, to be a house and, and not a home, as Helen makes clear in her memoirs. Um, she says, somehow we could not love the house. Heavy oak was raw and new and seemed to resent its servitude in beam and door. And without cracks would try to wrench itself free. There was nothing in that exposed position to protect us from the wind which roared and shrieked in the wide chimneys. Nor have I ever heard such furious rains dashed vindictively against our windows. Uh, often a thick mist enveloped us and the house seemed to be standing on the edge of the world. There's a terrific uh, sense of place to Helen's prose there, um, her fantastic interpretation of the oaks creaking as an effort to up sticks um, gives kind of character to this feeling of a place that won't become a place. It suggests um, that even the house doesn't want to settle in this uh, locality. Thomas's poem about the house has nothing of this character, nothing of this, nothing even of this sort of these sort of markings of, 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 of a place defined by its refusal to become a home. Um, he writes in a way that gives the house no sense of locality. It exists almost entirely as a, a psychic space. He enters the house alone. Um, and it's, it's often characteristic of these places which refuse to accommodate themselves to Thomas. That they, they refuse to make kind of company with him, refuse to befriend him in a way, um, and, and as he enters the house, he feels a bleak fate enclosing itself around him. And his lasting apprehension is of how, he says, of how the wind will sound after all these unhappy things to which he's fated should be. The place is scarred by and scars Thomas with the miseries that will form the backdrop to even before they've happened. Um, it's a place in this poem whose, whose character is, 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 is consists of its refusal to communicate anything other than its inhospitability. Um, and Thomas feels on entering it for the first time, a premonition of how hollow he will feel there in future years. Um, I think there's something to be said by a, a subtler critical imagination in mind about how far Thomas's apprehension of place is bound up with his imagining of places through time. Um, this is something which uh, strikes me it would be interesting to think about, but um, I have to say I haven't particularly. Um, this experience of dislocation isn't always so doom laden. Um, just to carry on through this small sweep of examples, here's the ending of uh, the path of the poem from the same month uh, in the summer of 1915, in which June, uh, in, in which Thomas again abstracts a particular local feature of a landscape, in this case, the path down a hill called Old, Old Stoner Hill, uh, which Thomas used to walk his children down to school. Uh, so this place seems at once intimately known, but bereft of any specific identifiable markings uh, and becomes 
something more symbolic. Uh, the poem describes a road and a path running alongside one another. The road traveled by adults, uh, the path by children. Um, and, and I suppose that the road and the path respectively become sort of symbols of um, different ways of, different modes of imagining life or different ways of apprehending uh, the places that we walk through. Um, so the children wear this path, they've flattened the bank on top and silvered it between the moss with the current of their feet year after year. But the road is houseless and leads not to school. To see a child the rare there, and the eye has but the road, the wood that overhangs and under yawns it, and the path that looks as if it led on to some legendary or fancied place where men have wished to go and stay till sudden it ends where the wood ends. Um, so in this poem, both children and the Penelope line says men explore this path and want to invest it with some magical significance. It almost does seem sympathetic to this wish, but it's a wish that leads nowhere. The path ends where the wood ends. And the ending of the poem, which coincides with the dissipation of the legendary or fancied place um, that the path promises to lead to, is weakly dismissive of our tendency to invest places and indeed perhaps invest poems with significances beyond themselves. It's just a path, that ending seems to say. There's nothing more to be made of it. And just as one third very quick example of um, this, this interest in feeling sort of dislocated or interest in places that refuse to swell into anything sort of anything of larger significance there's, there's the ending um, to the mill walk to um, a poem probably about steep mill but again a poem in which any particular reference has been stripped away so the poem seems to deal again in a more um, symbolic realm of experience. Um, and th this is a, a poem which offers a reminder that sense of place isn't just something personal, but it's something which might emerge from a locality's uh, communal significance. Mill full sound heard by those alone who are thinking and stop suddenly, and by those who watch long, so that they seem to feel with all who ever listened to it when the mill was there. Thomas has been said in a notebook in entry in June 1915, um, suggesting a kind of connection and, and participation in the spirit of this landscape. But his poem ends with a far less resonant, uh, less inclusive vision of a place marked only by its obsolescence, only the idle foam of water. And this is the, the final image of the poem, only the idle foam of water falling, changelessly calling where once men had a workplace and a home. Changelessly calling um, the constituent parts of this landscape endure beyond the significance with which human beings have inscribed them. Places can cease to be places or become ghosts of themselves. The ending of this poem seems to suggest. Um, so yes, there are many happy and cheerful moments of, of connection and participation in place in Thomas's poetry. Um, there are often, the poems are often records and indeed acts of the discovery of, of significance in places. But there's sometimes two reflections on the way in which landscapes won't let us feel at home in them in the way that we might like. And sometimes that's an occasion for melancholy and sometimes it's an occasion for um, a, a slightly more mordant wit in, in Thomas's. Um, so that's one thing that Thomas does with, with place. I thought I'd just end by spending five minutes with a poem, uh, The Ash Grove, uh, which shows how even when Thomas writes about the ways in which a place can accrue significance for us, um, he 
is able to convey the ways in which that significance develops uh, with a very peculiar sense of the life that places live in our mind um, and with a consciousness of the ways in which our pleasure in one place uh, or pleasure in that we might take in any given place at one particular time might shadow our um, apprehensions of the world beyond it. Um, and I will be just kind of in full and, and then make a few remarks about it. Uh, so this is the ash grove. Um, half of the grove stood dead and those that yet lived made little more than the dead ones made of shape. If they led to a house long before they had seen its fall. But they welcomed me. I was glad without cause and delayed. Scarce a hundred paces under the trees was the interval. Paces each sweeter than the sweet spirits of memory and fear with restless wing could climb down in to molest me over the wall that I passed through at either end without noticing. And now an ash grove far from those hills can bring the same tranquility in which I wander as a ghost with a ghostly gladness, as if I heard a girl sing the song of the ash grove, soft as love uncrossed. And then in a crowd or in distance they were lost but the moment unveiled something unwilling to die, and I had what I most desired without search or desert or cost. The poem uh, begins with a pair of lines which typify the strange things that catch Thomas's eye in a landscape and his strange way of looking at them. Here is a, a grove of ash trees, half of which stands dead. And what interests Thomas about the other half is that it only casts a little more shade than the dead half. It's very peculiar, seemingly inconsequential detail to, to sort of ease it into the poem with. The grove might have led to a house, but it's not clear. And um, this is a place which provokes uncertainty as much as intimacy and seems a bit like the mill, to be memorable uh, on account of its obsolescence. The, plain, the, the phrasing's rather plain, but the plainness lays bare certain odd suggestiveness in the idioms. Um, the trees stood dead. Uh, it strikes me as a strange thing to say, um, almost as if they have a kind of pride in their, their deadness. Um, if there had been a house present on this on the scene, the trees have seen its fall, as though the constituent features of a landscape can sort of bear bear witness to one another, um, and as if to suggest that the trees might be marked with a, a sense of loss uh, for the demise of what they once introduced. Thomas, welcomed by the place, is glad without cause, a phrase that suggests the, place, the ways in which place might almost sort of magically gladden us, but also intimates that his, his gladness in this place might be mistaken. Um, the second stanza attempts to describe the nature of that gladness. Um, to begin with, it draws on a rather sort of saccharine language. To do so, walking through the, the the kind of the boundaries of this ash grove involves taking pieces each sweeter than the sweetest miles. Um, these moments in Thomas's poems interest me. It's also as if he's trying to sort of wring the last drops out of a, a kind of exhausted late nineteenth century poeticality. But then this gives way. Um, to a to a, a more unconventional celebration of the place, um, perhaps a more truthful one, which describes the way in which Thomas's gladness in the place derives from the way in which it provides insulation from the world, 
from fear and memory, which are sort of imagined as trying to sort of claw their ways in, but can't do these insulated uh, from, the, from those things. And again, place and time seem to be, the interaction of place and time seems to be an important thing in Thomas's mind here. Uh, place allows us to temporarily drop out of our time-bound condition. And yet the poem works by moving us through time. Um, it develops in what's quite a characteristic manner for Thomas, I think, um, by taking us in time and place uh, to a point very distant from the point at which the poem seems to be taking place. Um, what I mean by that is that it's not clear until that and now in the third stanza that the ash grove of the title is something that the poets encountered long ago and, and that he's actually reflecting on from a, from a particular temporal distance. And Thomas ends the poem by saying broadly that any ash grove he encounters now provokes this same feeling in him. It's a kind of, in some ways, a version of Wordsworth's Daffodil's poem. Um, but I think it makes a lot of Thomas's poem poems when we, we try to sort of broadly paraphrase them. Um, and it's worth attending quite precisely to his attempts to, Thomas's attempts to really define the nature of the, the consolation that this memory of this place affords him. It affords a tranquility in which he wanders as a ghost, as though this ash grove, this place experienced in the past, has been a kind of culmination of his existence and all subsequent existence is marked by the urge to revisit it uh, from a kind of dim diminished, deadened state in its aftermath. Life will never live up to this wonderful vision again. There might be one of the intimations of that language of ghostliness there. Um, the experience of being reconnected with this moment of epiphany, Thomas says, is a bit like, it's as though hearing a song appearing and then vanishing. And the syntax momentarily threatens to descend into a, an account of the fragility of those connections with the past before it picks up again. Um, as Thomas says, it, this is a song which, in spite of its ephemerality, reveals something not something not permanent exactly, but at least unwilling to die, which is magically able to deliver this sense of gladness. A gladness which comes, he says, without cost. And yet the effect of that ending is to remind us that fulfillment in life ordinarily does involve cost. Um, so this is a poem which is, is drawn by the sense that places can live in our memory and nourish us. Um, but it's shadowed too by a sense that, sense of the, the Thomas's awareness of, of the pleasures of, of that sort of experience, uh, sharpened by his, his yearning to escape the contingencies of the world in a sense of the um, the less rewarding experiences of all the places outside this kind of glorious ash grove that has insulated him from the surrounding world on this one momentary occasion. Um, this is again a poem that's not principally marked by any particular sense of place. There's no effort to sort of localize this ash grove for us. Um, so much as it's a contemplation of the ways in which particular places stay with us. But let me just end by noticing one way in which the spirit of place does subtly infuse the poem. Um, the Ash Grove is the title of a Welsh tune which had various lyrics, but the, the version of the uh, tune that Thomas seems to have in mind in this poem, um, which is given on the slide there, it's one that is expressive of a, a longing for a home which one can never return to. Um, oh, that I had the swift wings of the swallow to fly to my home to return to my nest. And longing for home and my youthful companions, how hopeless the wish I shall never return. That folk song uh, 
says at the end of each of its stanzas. Um, and this allusion lends a certain local character, suggests that one way in which a poem might be marked by place is by incorporating the, the particular, the, the popular arts uh, associated with or that grow out of that place. But it does so in a way that means what gives this poem any sense of place or any sense of locality is the feeling of being unable to re revisit the place that it cherishes. Um, and with that very characteristically, very characteristic piece of mixed feeling, that celebration of place that is shadowed by an ironic sense of the impossibility of ever revisiting that place, um, that characteristic Thomas note, I'll, I'll end there. So thanks very much for, uh, for listening. Thanks very much, Andrew, that was lovely. Um, we're gonna move on to our second speaker and then we'll take questions for both Andrew and Ralph at, at the end. Um, so it's a real pleasure to introduce next Professor Ralph Pite, um, uh, who's a Professor of English Literature at Bristol University. Um, when Alex and I first sat down and started talking about Arts of Place, uh, Ralph was one of the first people that came to my mind as, as someone who would be fantastic to, 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 to become involved with, with Arts of Place. Um, Ralph's interests in literature and place are intricate and extensive, starting with his work on Romanticism and Italy, through his exploration of Coleridge's Quantox, um, brilliant work on Thomas Hardy and Wessex, a range of eco-critical research and careful attention to place writing of, of the 19th and the 20th centuries, um, right the way up to his um, recent study of the friendship between Robert Frost and Edward Thomas. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to be um, uh, able to introduce Ralph tonight and he's going to be speaking to us now about Thomas's prose. So please welcome Ralph Pipe. Thanks so much, Jessica. It's great to be part of it. And I've been really enjoying the the previous meetings of this group. I think it's a terrific uh, initiative and I'm really glad to be part of it. I'm going to share a screen. Um, I hope. There we are. Look, great. Um, Okay, uh, you'll all be aware, I'm sure that, uh, thanks very much, Andrew, by the way, I was really interested in Billy's points about not being where you should be and not feeling quite where you ought to be and a refusal to befriend or to feel that, that the place has refused to befriend you. I think this is something which is really, really present in, in Thomas's thinking and feeling. Um, yeah, so you'll be aware, I'm sure, that Thomas's career as a poet came to him briefly and late. For almost 20 years before that happened, he was writing prose. Prose had been his medium, or rather, you might say his media, because he was writing criticism, journalism, short stories, biography, autobiography, novels, and country books. These last for which, apart from his poems he is now, he is now best known, are a kind of nature writing and have been often invoked as a precursor by contemporary nature writers. The question whether Thomas is really a nature writer instantiates a larger question about Thomas's reception. Because of his variousness, critics have been willing or forced to choose the Thomas they want. Thomas's range of genre is matched by a range of styles, by a visible expertise which can seem chameleonic or knowing. And rather than praise Thomas for an eclectic mastery, critics have more often than not chosen one among his styles as the true one, as if by that means to solve the puzzle of his changeableness. So Edna Longley makes him plain and anti-rhetorical. Lucy Newland makes him downright and forceful like Hazlitt or Cobbett. 
Andrew Motion portrays him as the melancholy man of pastoral Englishness, and Andrew Webb turns him into a finely frenzied Welsh bard, while Stan Smith places him among the early socialists. All of these can be seen as attempts to answer Raymond Williams, who found Thomas's work to be pervaded by a questionable nostalgia. If though he can be all these different figures, can he be anything at all? Can it be anything distinctive or substantial? A friend to, a friend to all is a friend to none. Does his variousness suggest instead the facility of the prodigy? One thing which he undoubtedly was. Furthermore, as far as Thomas's nature writing is concerned, what is the impact of realizing that his rendition of nature is so stylistically self-conscious? One motive that promotes the critic's preference for either a plain speaking or a melancholic pastoral Thomas is the elision of this self-consciousness, as if Thomas had escaped it or recovered from it. And on this reading, the First World War made that escape possible, redeeming Thomas's career and purifying his consciousness. What in our lives is burnt in the fire of this, Rosenberg asked from the trenches. Not according to this account of Thomas, the heart's granary, but rather his hoarded aesthete's word hoard. Stoic, forlorn, plain man, Edward, offers therefore a consolatory reading of the enormous historical disaster and of Thomas's own death. It also means that through the arc of his career, nature is returned to us above and beyond the gradations of language and consciousness. His attractiveness as a forebear for contemporary nature writing may be, therefore, or to lie, therefore, in his life supplying a narrative of re immersion in the natural world. What a thing it is, says Jack to George in Thomas's poem, Lovers. This was a favorite phrase of Thomas's Wiltshire dad, David Azell, and one quoted often by Thomas himself in diaries and letters. In the chalk pit, the speaker who prefers the truth or nothing says that trees and men are imperfect friends, but between us still we breathe a mystery. A reading of Thomas cannot perhaps reconcile these two perspectives, but it needs somehow to encompass both. On the one hand, merry delight at the palpable energy and will of living things. See her run, she ran. And on the other hand, a mystery which human beings co-create, which they breed with their environment. The truth or nothing hints at such a Blakean contrary. Seeming at first just crossly impatient with fabrication, the phrase brings together the directness of truth and the mystery of nothingness. Perhaps these are the same. What a thing it is expresses after all surprise and bewilderment. It accedes to and acclaims the existence of the unaccountable. Truth is then always a mystery bred by some and just found by others, seen vividly or painfully reached towards amidst darkness. The mysteriousness of the actual is the note both these poems end on. That seems to me what Thomas always pursues the terrestrial and the extraterrestrial coinciding. Thomas at once earthy and alien. One of Wittgenstein's maxims is, it's not what it is, but that it is, which is the mystic. Thomas's thinking and writing runs along similar lines, though he stresses more acutely the clash between what it is and that it is. Reviewing Vernon Lee in 1907, he criticizes her stories for being preoccupied with putting labels on things. And he makes the same objection to Pater's style five years later. Chalk Pit speaker dislikes labels too. He wants the truth of things or he doesn't want them at all. For Jack and George, the question seems not to arise. The thing is what it is, as we say, true, as Thomas would often put it in his letters. Thomas himself is though much more like the speaker in the Chalk Pit. The constant question in his work is how to avoid labeling and how instead to breed a mystery together with the natural world to bring forth within language the mystery which labeling seeks to hide. A style that labels claims ownership. Stan Smith was the first critic of Thomas, so far as I know, to place him in the context of the land nationalization movement. 
enclosure and the loss of commons during the 18th century in the Romantic period concentrated land ownership in fewer hands, and it also made its definition more absolute. Thomas Spence's counter arguments at the time that land could not justifiably be owned by anyone became prominent in the years after Waterloo in conjunction with the beginning of the cooperative movement and the setting up of Owenite and Spencean communities in London in the 18, during the 1820s. The Chartists' land plan proposed wider reform of land ownership in mid-century and in Thomas's lifetime, the land nationalisation movement carried forward the same agenda. Although Smith's evidence for Thomas's left-wing sympathies is really hard to resist, his book, since it was published in 1986, has, done, has not done as much as you might expect to change Thomas's reputation. The ineffectiveness of the work in that respect raises questions, I think troubling questions for me, about present day literary culture and also about the centenary commemoration of the First World War. But it does arise also from something in Thomas himself. For Smith, Thomas's sense of his own superfluity is resolved by his becoming affiliated to a socialist position. But for Thomas, non-alignment does not ever really go away. He was suspicious of the enlightened who, with the best intentions, sought to improve the condition of the poor, suspicious because of how appropriating they became. The Heart of England, which was Thomas's first full-length country book, takes issue with Ford Maddox Huyfer's, Ford Maddox Ford's books, The Heart of the Country and The Soul of London. Huyfer's reforming eye labels the indigent owning the other, owning the other while seeking to better their condition. I mean, Thomas certainly admired Huyfer and admired Hella Ballot too, whose book, The Old Road, about the Pilgrim's Way, he read with great interest and pleasure. The Heart of England, though, disputes both, disputes Belloc's certainties, topographical, historical, religious, cultural, for the same reasons that it questions whoever's unconsciously proprietorial care for the poor. Ownership for Thomas is therefore an unjust societal reality, which a style of writing may all too easily extend, one which writing may by its nature be hard pressed to avoid. When is a name not a label? When is a description not an appropriation? All of Thomas's various prose is taken up, I think, with these questions. And I want to illustrate that today from Yet Nil Way. Although it's an uneven and sometimes unsatisfactory book, its oddness discloses the priorities implicit in Thomas's other work. And I think these stranger qualities have been sidestepped by the book's advocates, notably by McFarlane in his book, The Old Ways. And so a reading of The Old Way may begin to indicate how Thomas offers a challenge to nature writing now as well as then. Secondly, and as I perhaps will be clear already, I read Thomas as a modernist. He was seeking to make it new. And his example may suggest that the new nature writing is not making it new enough. Thirdly, and related to both the above and the reformulation of them, reading the Eight Way may raise the question, how do we walk through a land which is both ours and not ours, where belonging to it does not imply either material or emotional possession of it, and even perhaps depends upon relinquishing an idea of possession. And my thinking here has been informed, I should add, by Kate Ridley's discussion of Australian poetry in her recent book, Reclaiming Romanticism particularly the encounter, the encounter she describes between English language writing and Aboriginal ideas of country. Thomas wrote the book in 1911, it was published in 1913, and in 1911 he was under particularly extreme work pressure. He wrote to his friend Gordon Bottomley in August, in the haste of pressure of much work I may stumble upon myself again, and a stronger self. But by mid-September, six weeks later, when he was coming to the end of the project, he said, well, I am really beginning to see myself. I suppose it is a good thing. Will mystery or the light of common day succeed to the mist that used to seem mystery? The book describes and follows the route of the Ickfield Way, which is a pre-Roman trackway running northeast to southwest across southern England, as perhaps you know, from Norfolk to the Wiltshire Downs. Though the exact route of this, this way is often hard to trace. With other ancient routes, the watersheds created the roads, as Thomas puts it, but the Ickneald Way is a hill, fo hill foot road that has crept persistently but humbly under the Chilterns and the Berkshire Downs, 
It's run more risks than the ridgeway from the plough and often vanished. Thomas devotes an introductory chapter to the endless controversies which has produced the multitudinous conjectures and stupefying fictions, as he puts it. And in response, Thomas's own book becomes literal, empirical, following its itinerary chapter by chapter. First day, Thetford to Newmarket by Lackford and Kentford. Second day, Newmarket to Odsey by Ickleford and Royston, and so on. It pursues the route with great care, detailing each step of the way and each moment of doubt. The journey undermines scholarly authority and does not provide a reliable alternative. Even the field working walker cannot be sure of their way. The route is elusive and it will not be possessed. Similarly, the walker's position is questionable and vulnerable. The book exposes the will to power, the will to possess of both the antiquarian scholar and the topographical writer. It does not do so, however, from a secure position of its own. Instead, the first person narrator of the book appears an in interloper. Because he does not belong, he can expose the claims to ownership made by others, by scholar, tourists, the drives of motor cars on dusty roads, or the racing types at Newmarket. When he meets the natives, on the other hand, the outsider status they share creates an odd fellowship. In chapter four, the way becomes a series, he says, four miles long consecutive cart tracks leading to a farmyard with a well. Thomas knocks at a cottage door to ask for water and gets no answer. Just as I was turning to get water for myself, a human being with black hair and wild eyes looked out from the window and hailed me with a kind of scream. She was a thin, hawk-faced woman, bare and brown to the breast and with glittering blue eyes, and in her upper jaw, three strong teeth. She was dressed in black rags. She shaded her eyes to look at me as if I were half a mile away. The description has the same flatness here as his step-by-step -step itemization of the route. The woman's upper jaw possessed three strong teeth. She was dressed in black rags. But her glittering blue eyes recall for a moment Coleridge's ancient mariner, and her hawk, her hawk face is Dickensian. On the other hand, shading her eyes as she does, as if I were half a mile away, she seems more perplexed than Coleridge's overbearing storyteller. So the word glittering foregrounds a literary pattern through which the woman might be seen, providing a cue and signaling a willingness shared by writer and reader to rely on such cues to normalize the stranger. By adding blue and giving other details in stark and flat prose, Thomas dislodges the authority of a stereotyping perspective. Plainness is made possible not through direct means, but by Thomas's enacting a transition beyond literary effect. The thing itself, in itself, as it really is, reveals the mystery bred by encounter, by perplexity, by reaching towards apprehension with all the means at one's disposal. A similar quality distinguishes the style of the conversation that follows. You're thin boy, she said, like me. Yes, a pause. Are you middling well off? Yes, middling, are you? Oh, middling, but times are hard. They are. She looked extraordinarily sad, and I said, still, we shall have a few years to wait for the workhouse. So in this literal seeming transcription, the woman's peculiarity survives, but much is left hanging. Is she extraordinarily sad because she hoped for money from this well-off stranger? The woman would have reason to expect this. He would know that this was the expectation. So her saying, but times are hard, could be the first step in her asking for charity. His blunt agreement, they are, forestalls any potential request for help. It's laconic stoicism, moreover, is typically rustic. As if Thomas is adapting that demeanor to make clear his disavowal of the class position which the woman assumed, assumed must be his. Her being disappoint, disappointed at this would come as no surprise, but Thomas notes that she looked extraordinarily sad, and this raises further questions. Is she truly in need or even going hungry? If that's suspected, Thomas is apparently reassuring next remark, still we shall have a few years to wait for the workhouse, seems to brush aside that possibility. He offers a platitude without malice and yet heartlessly. His innocence and callousness convey, furthermore, his own helplessness. They are strangers then, these two. He knows nothing of her situation, nor she anything of his. Looking closely and attentively at another person reveals the depths of the observer's ignorance of them, and equally their ignorance of the observer. 
the encounter has power and authenticity of that negative kind. It forbids speculation or extrapolation. The genuineness of the meeting is shown by its stubborn uncertainties. What a thing it is, and what a mystery. Yet to discover mystery in it risks aggrandizing both the experience itself and the self who encounters strangeness. Thomas writes of the woman as a strangeness in the light of common day. After drinking his water, Thomas goes on his way and looking back, he sees the woman again, framed clearly against a solitary pink washed cottage. She stared after me, shading her eyes. There's a moment of pathos here, I think, enhanced by her shading her eyes again, repeating the gesture Thomas observed at the beginning. She appears trapped in her wary withdrawal from other people, in her difficulty seeing them. That sentence begins and ends a paragraph, lending the woman an, inv an inviolable particularity just for a moment, a, a moment at parting. And the last chapter of Thomas's book on Painter, on Pater, does something similar. The new paragraph begins, however, almost as if the, the encounter had not occurred. Two or three times along these four miles of the road, I saw a square of trees projecting a farm. If the woman is troubled by others, so it seems is Thomas becoming topographical, as if to brush under the carpet the poignancy of her isolation and poverty. The similarity between the necessity suggested, suggested and the gesture which seeks to hide it. Furthermore, what Thomas draws attention to in the landscape hints at the self-protectiveness of isolated people, those like the woman who withdraw into seclusion, and those like himself who keep both their fellows and their feelings at arm's length. His abrupt return to the pattern and stock in trade of his book at this point does not only recover normalcy, however, it seems to be re reasserting control. Just beforehand in the conversation between them at her well, the woman twice told Thomas twice, you're thin boy, a bit like Miss Havisham. And the second time Thomas replies, now in the moon perhaps I should get fat. Perhaps indeed, now I too, but look at the moon, you give me the horrors, you couldn't live there. And it was a thin three quarters of a circle in a hot sky. But I said, I should like to try, would you? Yes, provided I was someone different, for as for me, this is no doubt the best of all possible worlds. Better than the moon? Yes, better than the moon. And there is nothing better in it than your well water, Mrs. Good afternoon. I mean, the extravagance of these remarks by Thomas is as little commented on as the woman's intrusive questions. If he meant to tease her, amuse her, confuse her, or impose himself on their exchange, or whether her directness has somehow prompted him to disclose his sense of powerlessness in the face of thinness and poverty. All these thoughts are prompted in the reader and none of them is securely preferred. And the echoes here of other encounters, especially of Christ's meeting with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, are similarly, are similar in impact, hard to miss and yet equally hard to make anything of. His echo of Voltaire's Dr. Pangloss, all for the, it's for the best and the best of all possible worlds, echoes to Voltaire's sardonic treatment of such optimism. That rare instance of eternal security lasts her than, no more than an instant, as Thomas's dry irony is followed by a compliment, at once well-mannered, a skillful way of closing the conversation, and an expression of seemingly sincere gratitude. There is nothing better in it, there is nothing better in it than your well water, Mrs. This is. Thomas leads the conversation from a fanciful dream of escape to first disillusionment and world weariness, and after that, pleasure in the everyday. And he becomes, therefore, as perplexing a figure as the woman he meets. And throughout the book, he reports his inconsistencies. He records his own unaccountable remarks and actions. Fidelity to the external implies, it seems, a similar unvarnished fidelity to what lies within. And without such self-exposure, which might seem indifferent towards your interlocutor and to your reader, the risk is you will remain what Thomas calls a bungalow countryman, condescending to those you describe, kindly, lofty and interpretative, proprietorial in your detachment. Hence the narrator comes to resemble instead the road itself, 
creeping obscurely from place to place, marginal, easily erased, at the foot of the downs rather than on the heights, doubtful, not authoritative, thin, not fat, minutely detailed and shunning the grand gesture of the antiquarian scholar or cultural commentator. The dislocations in the storytelling and their abruptness allow Thomas's perplexity to remain something lived through. It can be experienced by the reader as inconsistency and not turned into his nature or condition. In the same way, the mysteriousness of things survives in the book as something encountered without being transformed into a frame for perception, an epithet, or a convention of feeling. The perplexing mystery of Thomas himself survives then through the style and is also addressed within the book via encounters, other encounters that are self-encounters. The other man of In Pursuit of Spring and Thomas's poem, The Other, is foreshadowed in these meetings. The first is with a philosopher he finds on Ivanhoe Beacon in the Chilterns, and the second in probably the, it occurs in probably the most famous passage from the book. The narrator is lying awake, listening to the rain. As he listens, he begins to hear words which seem to be spoken by a ghostly double beside me. I have done evilly and weakly, and I have left undone. Fool, you never were alive. Lie still, stretch out yourself like foam on a wave, and think no more of good or evil. There was no good and no evil. There was life and there was death, and you chose. Now there is neither life nor death, but only the rain. Overwhelming as this lengthy monologue undoubtedly is, its despair does not halt the book's progress. Chapter 11 ends with the ghostly double finishes his speech. Chapter 12 begins, on the following morning early, I returned to where I had left my conjecture road, which I shall now call Ickleton Street. On the journey goes with odd insouciance. The ghostly double is allowed his moment as the woman earlier stood out from the landscape, but it also seems as if the book has no memory of its own feelings. Then just a little later, they are recalled. As I was leaving Wantage, I heard a blackbird singing in a garden beyond the church. This was near the middle of August and a full month since I, last, I had last heard one. The heat had dried up the bird's songs all much earlier than usual and now the rain of the last night seemed to be reviving one. The song was perfect and as strange of things last year's snow. This is the first reference in chapter 12 back to the rain of last night and the echo is defiant. The ghostly double insisted that rain, quote, puts out summer like a torch. In the morning, summer has revived, nonetheless. I don't think this moment drowns out the bleak pages given to the ghostly double, neither does it establish a morally instructive contrast teaching the reader to set aside self-pitying despondency. To an extent, it seems to prove the ghostly double right. He heard, he says, once, through the rain, a bird's questioning watery cry, which brought up against him the order of nature, all its beauty, exuberance, and everlastingness, like an accusation. Here, the next morning, is that cry again. Here is nature's exuberance, reviving, everlastingly. In the swift transition from one chapter to the next, Thomas, as we put it, moves on. There is a sense that this is natural. The next day's work is there to be done. The birds come out and sing again. Yet this does not bring with it necessarily a sense of comfort. The journey might appear to be leading to the discovery of a stronger self. The new day might seem to bring with it the opportunity to leave behind the ghostly double. Possibly though, only the light of common day will arrive when the mist clears away. And this more modest recovery may be the greater achievement. Perhaps that is enough to hope for, or quite enough to aim at, the light of common day, the unpossessed exuberance and everlastingness held in common, the presence of the thing and what a thing it is, the mystery between us. Why take that for granted? Or one's ability to see it. Thanks. That was extraordinary, Ralph. Thank you so much. It was unsettling and suggestive and enigmatic, just like Thomas, and sending its helicopter out over the moon 
wow. Um, we'll go till 10 past six just to get a little bit of discussion in if that's all right. Um, could I ask people to either put a question in the, the chat if you'd like to, or feel free just to flip your camera on and shout out. And if everyone shouts at once, I will disentangle you. Um, perhaps I can perhaps I can take the privilege and, and ask a, a question of both of you, actually. Um, it's quite, it's quite a practical question after that amazingly poetic ending to Ralph, but I, I wanted to ask what Thomas does to, to think about places or read about places or to research them before he goes there. And I suppose I'm thinking about this in relation to that balance between the common knowledge and idiosyncratic responses to places, the common knowledge of, of Welsh folk tunes versus the idiosyncrasy of one's response in the moment. Is there a sense in which he senses his own reading in order to remain fresh or does he have a habit of readily preparation? As far as um, Ignil Way goes, he clearly spent quite a lot of time doing some preliminary reading on that. I and mean, the first chapter is a great Kind of synopsis of the various historical antiquarian accounts of the road um and i, I think what you can i mean you you know, know yourself from in pursuit of spring and, and other books that he he will also in in following a route he will identify the writers on that route and read up mm. on them and kind of put them into the route so there's a sense of going through the, the common knowledge of landscape and you know, plant life and fauna and flora and place names, and then sort of in, introduce into that the special, specialist knowledge of the literary critic. Um, that would be my feeling about it. I don't know what happens you would be. I'm not sure I've got anything to add other than, um, other than agreement. Uh, he certainly, there's the book which we were talking about uh, earlier, the literary pilgrim in England, where which is not interesting, it's not arranged by places, but it's arranged by, uh, in the index, by writers grouped into sort of large constellations of places. But the first thing you encounter is Blake, or, and then you, you're going to London, or um, hardly you know, the West Country or whatever. Um, but he certainly seems to, to think that one of the ways in which you get to know a place is through what's been the way it's been built up in a literary tradition or the way a literary works of literature have been layered over it and, and created um, associations and invested in particular significances. I think he's interested in that in particular. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I've had, I've had a question sent to me on email actually, so perhaps I'll throw that out in the ring to, to, to both of you. Um, this is from Elizabeth Harris, and she says, in the South Country, Thomas writes about the home counties being more welcoming to modern types who don't belong anywhere. Do you think that in Hampshire and Steep specifically, he finally found a sense of home? And if so, to what extent do you think this idea of home was clarified by enlisting? in the knowledge that he may never return. Uh, well, I, 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 maybe I could answer that by thinking about the poems. I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure, I, I'm not sure I would want to say that I knew exactly how Thomas felt at all times, but the poem seemed to me to be endlessly unsettled um, and endlessly wanting to, for all their love of place, quite often wanting to be on the move or quite often wanting to be, um, uh, th there's something questing about them. They're, they're never quite uh, settled. Uh, they're never quite poems that are, um, happy in the place where they are. So I, I'm not sure whether the, the poetry in particular is born out of a, a sense of contentment, ever, ever born out of a sense of contentment of being in a one particular place. Certainly there are, are poems 
that dwell on moments of feeling at home in places, but they're often vanished moments or moments that can't be recaptured. Um, and other times he's, he, as, in the, as he is in the prose as well, he's walking along, he's traveling, he's, he's a poet who's always moving rather than a poet who feels particularly ever at home in any one place, I think. That's the impetus behind most of the, the, the best poetry. Thanks, Andrew. Any more? Yes, I agree about that. I mean, just, just about steep, and steep is also really a focus of kind of quite divided feeling, I think. I mean, it, it seems the ideal place for him to live. You know, the children at Beedales, his wife is working there, he's surrounded by kind of kindred spirits. But it seems also, as Andrew was illustrating from the poem New House and Another One Wind and Mist, he felt he felt quite uncomfortable with his own settledness, I think. And the, 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 the kind of the bungalow countryman figure is, I think, almost a figure that he kind of identifies or connects with that steep community of sort of bohemian rust ruralists um, who aren't kind of quite the real thing or quite authentic. Um, I think the question about what happens when he enlists is incredibly complicated and that um, it's as if those wonderful bits he writes in the, 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 the essays in 1914 when, when war's beginning about home and country being a succession of intersecting circles, concentric, you know, intersect, everybody's, everybody's point of home is their own, their own place and yet they all inter interconnect and overlap with one another. I think, I think he's get, he's developing at that point really interestingly new metaphors for how um, how you can be at home by not being at home um, within other people's sense of home as well as your own. Any more? Just yeah, go on. If no one else has got a question, then I'll, I'll um, I'd like I'd, I'd like to ask um, a question about form, um, and and one of the things that strikes me about about Thomas's poetry is his his use of lineation and endowment and this sense of of boundaries. And um, I wonder if both both speakers could perhaps comment a little bit on um, on the kind of the blankness of of his form, but also I was I was interested in that um, Ashgrove poem in the use of hexameters. I was trying to figure out what what, what the what the meter was of that of that poem. So um, thinking about boundaries and trying to always get away from boundaries and also kind of cling on to them in different ways. Um, I wondered if you could perhaps say something about that. Go on, Andrew. Okay. Um, I like the idea of uh, that phrase, the blankness of his form, although I'm not, not sure I'd entirely be able to pin down what I understood by it. Um, but I, th I think. Obviously, one of the things he's trying to do with with form is write in a way that is continue rather than breaking with a, a past like the more sort of cosmopolitan modernist. He's trying to find a form, a way of writing that's modern but continuous with a a, a native tradition or a tradition of English verse that that marks the writing off. As being from being part of a particular literary tradition related to a particular place. Um, so, so the, the, the effort to find a kind of a, a relaxed blank verse that captures the speaking voice, but captures the hesitations, the stutterings, the meanderings, and the sort of corrugations of the speaking voice as much as the you know, just a simple flow of eloquence that, that sort of 
flows on and endlessly in a sort of Parnassian manner um, is, is part of what he's up to. The meter, I think, is extremely interesting and, and, and um, something that I've never, that I keep meaning to, to think about when I read the poems is, is, is how you might scan them. I, I've never really successfully or uh, consistently or attentively done that. I'm sorry to say. Um, the the one thing that strikes me that he does do though in the song like poems is is and as for instance in the Ash Grove it it it's, it tries on occasion it seems to rise into anapests but it'll never make a fully anapest I mean, you quite often get these effects of song aspired to but never quite attained in, in some of the more stanzaic lyrical lyrical um, lyrically formed poems which is a quite an interesting effect to find I think. Um, I'll let Ralph say something a little more eloquent and intelligent than I've been able to, to mind. <laughs> no, I think that's really right. Suggest. I think, I guess the, in connection with what I was sort of talking about, it, it seems to me that sometimes he tries to make enjambment stumble into the kind of the presence of the ordinary again, so that he doesn't sort of, in he, he doesn't create um, defamiliarization or a sense of refreshing your apprehension of things by kind of neologism or you know disrupted syntax or those other kind of modernist strategies but he has a way of making a that one with I was just looking at the one from um, and trees and us imperfect friend we men and trees so the second time you get the trees they're kind of right underneath each other and and you go back and tree and you're sort of brought up against the idea that a tree is not a man or a tree is a thing a different thing it's not just a word there's a way in which he makes the the referent sort of emerge from behind the, the the word itself, I think. Well, that seems to be one of the things that he he sort of uses these stumbling, as Andrew puts it, these stumbling enjambments to create. I'm going to bring things to a, a close there. Um, but it's just such a pleasure to be in company with people who spontaneously use phrases like the corrugations of the speaking voice um, and who are able to make Thomas so strange for us again. Um, to, I want to go immediately back to read the Ignald's way again. I think I was so baffled by its, its strange scenes and its capacity to then just get up and carry on. But now I want to just dwell in those, those strange moments of transition. Um, this has been really, really eye-opening and a beautiful end to a summer day. Thank you, Andrew and Ralph so much. And thank you, to everyone who's come. Uh, please do join us again next time. Thank you.